Well, thank you, Pastor. Well, I hope you did your homework from this morning. Pastor gave you an assignment. How many of you did it? You read the little sheet inside the bulletin today? That was your homework. And some of you didn't get to it. I can tell. So now I have to tell jokes to get you focused. See, if you would have done your homework, I wouldn't have to tell any stories or jokes. You'd just be ready to go. I'm not a very good joke teller. Uh, kind of reminds me of the fellow that was visiting the prison. And he was taking a tour, and the warden was taking him through the prison. And they were going up and down through the cells block there. And all of a sudden, one of the prisoners inside his cell, he yelled out, 16! And everybody in the whole prison began to just laugh. Just hilariously laugh. He thought that was a little strange. They walked a few more steps and somebody yelled out, 44! And again, the place burst in laughter. Walked a few more steps, another guy yelled from his cell, 105! Man, the place went wild, just laughter. Well, this was about all he could take. He said to the warden, he said, what's going on? They yell these numbers and people laugh. The warden said, well, there's only one joke book in the prison library. And they've all read it. And they've all memorized it by page number. And so they don't bother to tell the jokes. They just call the page number. Everyone laughs. He said, wow. He said, you mind if I try? Warden said, go ahead. So he cleared his throat. And he said, uh, 14. Complete silence. <laughs> Nothing. Kind of looked at the warden. He said, well, tr try again. 27. Nothing. Not a sound. Silence. The guy said to the warden, what's going on? They yell the numbers and everybody laughs. I, I yell the numbers and nobody laughs. The warden said, well, some people can tell a joke and some people can't. <laughs> so do your homework, okay? John chapter 11. John chapter 11 tonight. Let's get to it. I'm going to read two verses right in the heart of this story, and we'll fill in the story as we go. But a marvelous story in the Word of God in John chapter 11. And I call your attention to verses 25 and 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Believest thou this? God specializes in bringing dead people to life. Years ago, I was preaching in a, a church in Viroqua, Wisconsin, the Bethlehem Baptist Church. It was Sunday morning, and they had all the adult classes meet in the auditorium. I taught a lesson. The pastor, after we were finished with that Sunday school hour, he said, come on, let's just sit down over here on the platform. And, and uh, we went and sat down, just had a few minutes before the morning service would begin. And we were sitting there, and folks were arriving and coming in, and the back doors of that auditorium, they swung both ways. They swung either way. You could push and go out, or you could push and come in. You could pull and go out. You could pull and come in. They, they just kind of went back and forth, and people were coming through. And pretty soon, those doors kind of swung open, both at the same time, and a very small, kind of a frail man in a wheelchair entered. You could tell that his body was primarily paralyzed, but... He was able to control that wheelchair with his finger, with a little uh, button there of some kind or a wire, and he was, he was moving that wheelchair into the auditorium and parking it near the back row. 
The pastor leaned into me and he said, did you see that gentleman in the wheelchair? I said, yes, sir. He said, his name's Gordy. He said, he's not a Christian. He's a psychiatrist. He has a doctorate in psychology. I thought, great. He's not gonna like me. <laughs> we had the song service, I began to preach and my supposition was true, he didn't like me. You could see his body tensing up in that wheelchair, his face would turn bright red at times and you could see that he was not liking the message. When I finished, service was over, I went to the back and out into the lobby and I chose a place to stand there in front of a large plate glass window that looked out to the front yard of the church and onto the main street. And I stood there and people began to come by and shake hands and give a greeting, of course, and all of a sudden those, those doors, they flung open and here came Gordy in his wheelchair. And he was in high gear. And he was making a beeline right for me. And I am kind of looking around at that window thinking, am I going to go through this? <laughs> Boy, he came about fifth gear right up to me and he hit that little wire and that wheelchair just kind of came to a screeching stop. It, it rocked forward and then back. And he took his gnarled little finger and he pointed up at me and he said, Mr. Getch, he said, you are the worst preacher I've ever heard in my life. And he hit that wire and that wheelchair spun around and he went out of that church. And I thought, God bless you too. <laughs> Three years almost to the date, I returned for a second revival at Bethlehem Baptist Church. I taught the Sunday school hour. I sat on the platform between services. And sure enough, as if history was repeating itself, those back doors flung open and that same guy in that same wheelchair came flying in. And I thought to myself, what are the chances of a guy coming to church twice in his life and I happen to be the only guy that he's ever heard me heard preach? Well, I tried not to look at him. I knew he wouldn't like my message any more than he liked the first one. And so I, I tried not to look at him. I tried not to focus on him at all during the service. I preached and when I finished, I went to the lobby and I stood in front of that same plate glass window. And sure enough, a few minutes later, those doors were hit and that wheelchair came at high speed right toward me again. And I thought, here we go again. And he got up to me and he hit that wire and that thing rocked forward and then back. And he said, Mr. Getch, do you remember me? How do you forget people like that? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, the last time I heard you preach, I told you you were the worst preacher I've ever heard in my life. He said, you know, you haven't changed much. But he said, I sure have. He said, I've been saved. I never forgave him for that comment. <laughs> Gordy and I became wonderful friends. Went back and preached there many times after. Always enjoyed the fellowship with Gordy Robson. He gave up his practice of psychiatry. Moved to Pasco, Washington became the director of the Bible Institute there, the Riverview Baptist Church. Literally wrote all of the Bible curriculum for that institute by blowing air through a straw onto a keyboard until God took him home. God specializes in bringing the dead to life. Have we stopped believing in the resurrection? I am the resurrection and the life. Who do you know tonight that is dead in trespasses and sin? A neighbor? A co-worker? A loved one? A friend? Who do you know tonight that needs a resurrection? 
I wonder, Christian, is there a miracle that you've given up on tonight? Is there something, a situation that perhaps you have declared to be hopeless? God says, I am the resurrection. Believest thou this? Before us tonight, we have a story of death. But because of Christ's intervention, it is a story about a resurrection. And I want you to notice six chapters in this story about a resurrection tonight. The chapter opens with a sad dilemma. You know, life is never smooth, is it? Now, life never goes exactly like we intend for it to go. There are unexplained events that take place in our life, unplanned circumstances. No doubt this week, all of us will have something that will come into our path that we did not anticipate, something that we weren't quite expecting, something that may sort of take us off track if we're not careful, a, 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 a sort of a curveball, we might call it, or something out of left field. Life never goes exactly as planned. As this chapter opens, we see a sad dilemma. We see a degenerating sickness in verse number one. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Here was a degenerating sickness. No doubt some remedies had been tried. No doubt some medicine had been administered. Perhaps they had even gone to see a doctor. We don't know all of the details. But it would appear to me that as kind of a last resort, they let Jesus know about this sickness of Lazarus. They would not, not have bothered the Lord, I don't believe, unless all other things had been exhausted. And there was no human solution. Uh, the sickness was greater than the resources or the knowledge that they had. And their only hope was to turn to the Lord. It reminds me of the woman who had an issue of blood in the Bible. She had been sick for 12 years. The Bible said she had spent all that she had on many physicians, but was nothing better, but rather, rather grew worse. And finally she thought, if I could just touch the hem of the garment of Jesus Christ, I would be whole. And no doubt here in this sad dilemma was a degenerating sickness but aren't you glad in the midst of trials, in the midst of difficulty, there is a devoted Savior? In verse number two, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Aren't you thankful that our Savior loves us? Aren't you thankful that we have a God who cares? God is love. We can cast all our care upon him for he careth for you. The Bible tells us that even the very hairs of our head are all numbered. We have a devoted Savior. Now, we would think in this story, as we get to this point, that Jesus, once he receives the word, that somebody that he cares a great deal about, someone that he loves, he will leave wherever he is, he will leave whatever he is doing, and he will come and provide the healing that is sought. After all, Jesus could heal the sick. Uh, the Mary and Martha, they knew that Jesus had the power to touch a man's eyes and he would be able to see once again. They knew that he could heal the deaf. He knew that he could make, they knew that he could make the lame walk again. And no doubt the reason they sent word to Jesus was because they knew that he had the power to heal. But we see a delayed solution. In verse number four, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. A delayed solution. God doesn't always answer your prayers the way you pray them. If he did, he wouldn't be God. You would. 
God's timing is sometimes not our timing. You'll find that sometimes God's no to your prayers turns out later to be a greater yes. Because God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We won't always understand the delay to our request. We won't always understand why the Lord abides still in the same place where he was two days. Oh, the psalmist in Psalm 13 and verse 1, he said, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? In Psalm 69 and verse 3, I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail, for I wait for the Lord. In Psalm 119 and verse 82, Mine eyes fail for thy words, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? So often in the dilemmas of life, so often in the trials and difficulties of life, we wonder, Lord, where are you? I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. A sad dilemma. And this sad dilemma leads to a sudden death. In this delay, we see a worsening progression. In verse number seven, then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. Goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there's no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. A worsening progression. Jesus says, our friend Lazarus is sleeping. And I need to go down and wake him up. And the disciples are confused. They're thinking, Lord, if, he, if he's sick and he's able to rest, that's a good thing. And, and we don't need to go down there. The last time we were there, they tried to kill you. Are we going to risk our lives just to wake a man out of sleep? But Jesus said, no. Lazarus is dead. A worsening progression. Problems left to themselves never solved themselves. We think, oh, our spiritual condition, it'll somehow get better somehow. Uh, somehow this, this lack of revival, this apathy, this disobedience that I'm in right now, it'll, it'll somehow work itself out, but the problems never solve themselves. Here's a worsening progression that leads to a woeful pronouncement in verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Many a person who's never trusted Christ as Savior thinks it will never come to hell. We think, oh, our sin is a lot of fun. We think, uh, I don't want to surrender right now to God. I don't want to get saved. I don't want to become a Christian. Look at what I'm going to miss. Look at all this fun I'm going to lose out on. And, and man thinks, I'll just live my life as I please. And it won't come to death. Sometimes as a Christian, we get pretty comfortable in our backslidden conditions. We get comfortable in our apathy, our indifference, our disobedience. We get comfortable in our sin. And we think it will never come to something terrible. It will never come to something tragic. It will never come to some, some horrible result. But the Bible says, He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. A sudden death. Well, end of the story, right? Lazarus is dead. Last chapter. No sense reading on in this. End of story. But notice the story doesn't end. 
But we see a sinful doubt. Jesus, in the midst of this terrible circumstance, gives a call to faith. Look at verse number 16, or verse number 15. He says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Jesus declares this man is dead. And Jesus says, I'm glad we weren't there. Because I want to call you to faith. So often, all we see in our human eyes is death. All we see is the dilemma. All we see is the destruction. We see through our unbelief. I don't know how many times I've heard someone say to their pastor, Pastor, I just don't see how we're going to do this. Pastor, I just don't see how I could ever live the Christian life. I just don't see how I could ever get rid of this stubborn habit in my life. Uh, Pastor, I just don't see how the church could have revival in this particular time period. Pastor, I don't see how we could support any more missionaries. Pastor, I don't see how we could ever build that building. Pastor, I just don't see. You know what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, when we look at a situation like this, end of story, end of the chapter, the book might as well close. Lazarus is dead. But we see here that God calls us to faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are we walking by faith tonight or are we walking by sight? He that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Here's a call to faith. But notice a caving to fatalism. Verse 16, then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. The reason miracles are not happening today is because we don't believe they can happen today. Here's Thomas, one of the disciples. Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad we weren't there because of your unbelief. And yet Thomas says, well, let's go. He's determined to go. We got to go down there. Probably get killed. A caving to fatalism. Amazing verse in Matthew 13, verse 58. It says of Jesus, he did not many mighty works there. Because of their unbelief. I wonder what the Lord wanted to do in that place. I wonder what miracle he wanted to perform. But he moved on. Because of their unbelief. I wonder what miracle God would like to do in a life that's present in Lancaster Baptist Church tonight. But I wonder if God will say, let's move on. There's no faith. Wouldn't it be something if God would look at my life or yours tonight and say, man, I'd like to bless that guy. I'd like to use that person. I'd like to bring something great through their life. But no, it's... Let's move on. There's no faith. What a sad thing for God to look at Lancaster Baptist Church tonight and say, I'd like to do something wonderful there. They haven't seen the, the hem of the garment. They haven't seen uh, even close to what I want to do there. I want to do a great miracle there. I want to bring a revival in that place. I want to spread that revival from Lancaster to the entire world. But no, let's, let's move on. There's no faith. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. God is calling us to faith tonight. 
And while we look at some situations and we declare them impossible, we declare them uh, uh, impossible, we say, God can't do that. But God specializes in the impossible. I was preaching a couple of weeks ago in Custer, South Dakota. Into the church on Sunday morning walked a lady that most people thought would never darken those doors. Her husband had been coming for some 10 years had invited his wife to come many, many times. He had witnessed to her. He had talked to her about the Lord. He invited her to services. But she was deeply religious and very committed to her beliefs that did not include Jesus Christ as Savior. But into that service, she came. People were somewhat surprised. People were shocked. Here she was. Oh, she had been on their prayer lists. Uh, they had talked about her at church. Uh, they had talked with her husband and said, hey, we're praying for your wife and so on. She sat very quietly and listened very intently. When I gave the invitation that morning, she lifted her hand that she was not saved. She did not come forward. As she left that morning, I was standing at the door and I shook her hand, and I said, I'm praying for you. She said, well, thank you. I said, I noticed you lifted your hand. She said, I did. I said, would you like to be saved, Rhoda? She said, I would. A lady was standing right across from me, faithful lady in the church. I caught her eye. I motioned for her to come. A few moments later, Rhoda was wonderfully saved. We were shocked. We were surprised. Why? Because of our unbelief. I wonder tonight, what miracle does God want to do this week? In your life, in the life of someone you know, may we not cave to fatalism. And we see along with this, this uh, subtle disappointment, if we read on beginning in verse 17, we see an ignored request in verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and to Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. As Martha comes out to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, as he arrives now some four days later, she goes out, she, she comes before him and she said, Lord, where were you? We asked you to come. We told you the problem. We were sure that you would respond. Lord, where were you? If you had come when we called, this wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't be in this situation. She begins to vent her frustration to this ignored request. In fact, drop your eyes down to verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Exact same words. Martha goes out, meets the Lord, says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. She goes back to the house. Now Mary comes out. Martha stays at the house. Mary comes down and says the exact same words. You know what that tells me? That had been the topic of conversation the last four nights around the dinner table. Where was he? I thought he loved us. I thought he cared. I thought we were friends. I, I thought it would come. It was an ignored request. And it led to an insincere repetition. If you look at verse 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? 
She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Some vain repetition. Some insincere repetition. We know what the right answers are. We know what the Bible says about God. We know what it says about faith. We have the right answers. I'm talking to people tonight in this room. You believe that the miracles recorded in the Bible actually happened. You believe that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry land. You know why you believe that? Because it's in here. It's recorded. And you've accepted the word of God as true. And so you believe in the miracle of God rolling back that water and allowing those Israelites to pass through that Red Sea on dry land. You believe that. You believe that Jesus Christ took five loaves and two small fishes and fed 5,000 men plus the women and the children and when everybody was full, they gathered up 12 baskets of leftovers. You believe that. You believe that actually happened. Because it's in here. You believe that Jesus Christ walked on water in here you believe the miracles of this book and you have heard people in your connection groups and you have heard people perhaps in a Wednesday night prayer meeting you've heard people stand up and say God answered my prayers God provided a job for me God healed me of cancer God restored a relationship in my life. You believe in modern day, present day, miracles today. But for some reason, God didn't answer your prayer yet. You believe. You prayed. You have faith. You trusted And God said, no. And you're sitting in this room tonight disappointed in God. There was a man in the Bible named Job. The Bible says Job was a great man. In fact, it tells us he was the greatest man in the East. This man, Job, was a great man materially. It lists his wealth in Job chapter 1. It tells us how many camels he had and how many sheep he had. And that was basically God's way in the Bible of showing us a man's bank account. Job was a, a rich man materially. He was a man that had a wonderful family, a wife and ten children, seven sons and three daughters. But Job was not just a great man in the material sense or the human sense. Job was a great man spiritually. The Bible says that Job feared the Lord greatly. The Bible says that Job feared the Lord and eschewed evil. He hated evil. In fact, Job was such a godly man that every morning Job would get up early and offer sacrifices according to the number of his children. That would be 10 sacrifices that Job offered every morning just in case his children sinned that day. And it says, thus did Job continually. Job was a great man. But one day, about that fast, God pulled the rug out from underneath Job. Everything falls apart. Job gets a message that all of his possessions have been stolen. His camels, his sheep, they're gone. The servants who were tending them have been killed or taken captive. 
He no more than gets the message of his material wealth being gone that now word comes that his ten children were in a house together and a tornado, a whirlwind comes through and takes the house and all of his children are suddenly in one storm dead. We read a few chapters more and Job has these horrible boils over his entire body. He is in intense pain and suffering. His friends come and they try to encourage him, but instead they they accuse him of being backslidden and away from God. And they said, Job, you better repent or you're going to die. And finally his wife comes and finally declares, Job, just curse God and die. Disappointment, 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 disappointment. But in Job 13 and verse 15, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I will maintain my own ways before the Lord. You know what we do when a little disappointment comes into our life? When God doesn't quite answer our prayers the way we prayed them? When God doesn't come through at the time we expected? When God doesn't meet our need just exactly the way we thought? We're the first ones out the door of the church. I don't know how many people I hear say to their pastor, Pastor, I'd I'd be there tonight, but we're just kind of going through it right now. You know, when you're kind of just going through it right now, it's a good time to be in church. But see, what we do when things don't go right is we quit reading this book. And we slack in our prayer life. And we stop going soul winning. And we stop giving in the offering. And we stop singing in the choir. And we stop our ways before the Lord. But not Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I maintain my ways before the Lord. It was a subtle disappointment. And I'm afraid tonight in this building there are people who are subtly disappointed. Oh, you'd never say it out loud. You'd never say anything bad about God, but in your heart there's a bitterness. Because God has not done what you thought he should do for you. With this subtle disappointment comes a selfish dishonor. In verse number 33, we see a very unpleasant atmosphere developing. In verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her, Mary, weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Can you feel the awkwardness here? Can you feel the anxiousness here? The the fear here? The apathy here? This is a very unpleasant atmosphere as Jesus arrives. There's tension in the air. And on this unpleasant atmosphere comes an unthinkable announcement. In verse 39, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. What? It would be like us walking to a cemetery tonight and someone saying, dig up the grave. Open the casket. An unthinkable announcement which brought an unsettling alarm to Martha. In verse 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. They did not have the ability to preserve the body after death in Jesus' day that we would know today. Today when a person dies, we have the technology and ability to preserve the body after death for a time. Perhaps to delay a funeral so loved ones and friends can gather. Sometimes in the case of an autopsy to determine the cause of death, the body is preserved for quite some time before burial. But not in New Testament times. When someone died in this time, they buried them quickly. 
usually the same day if it was in the evening, perhaps the next morning early. But now he is laying in this grave for four days. The corruption process has begun. The, the, the flesh is, is decaying. It's rotting. And, and Martha is unsettled. Please don't do this. Is God asking you tonight to do something that's unsettling? He's telling some of you to get saved. He's telling some of you to surrender. He's telling some to separate. He's telling others to serve. And our reaction oftentimes is one of unsettling. And do you know why it's unpleasant? And you know why it's unthinkable? And you know why it's unsettling? Because we are worried about us. Can I remind you that Jesus had said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God? Can I remind you that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. May I remind you, Jesus, knowing full well that when he said, Lazarus, our friend, is sleeping, he knew well that he was already dead. But he said, I go that I may awake him out of sleep. All the promises of God had been given, and yet they were all going right over Martha's head because Martha was only concerned about Martha. And so often in our lives there is a selfish dishonor we love the praise of men more than the praise of God. How can you believe we seek honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? No, oh, my friend, this can happen to the best. In the early part of the book of Acts, the apostles thought that the gospel was only to be preached to the Jews. And so they were faithfully delivering the gospel message, the salvation message to the Jews. But in Acts chapter 10, Peter receives a vision. Remember this? This, 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 this uh, curtain comes down, this, this cloth comes down, and, and there's all these animals here in this sheet. And, and, and Peter says those are clean and those are unclean. And God says, no, no, don't call anything unclean. And through that vision, God is telling Peter the gospel is not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles as well. Aren't you glad about that? Amen. And so now Peter begins to preach to the Gentiles. He goes down and he begins to spread the gospel among the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are getting saved. They're getting saved by faith, the same way the Jews got saved, and the same way we've got to get saved. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. And one night after service, Peter is fellowshipping with these Gentiles. He's rejoicing in their testimony of salvation. He, he's, he's rejoicing with them. But all of a sudden, into the room walked some Jews. And Peter quickly, he gets up from the table and he runs over and he sits down with the Jews because he feared them of the circumcision. In Galatians 2 and verse 11, Paul says, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Paul said, Peter, of all people you knew, you knew the gospel was for the Gentiles. God showed it to you first. You knew that. And yet, Peter, you got concerned about Peter. And how many times do we miss a miracle in our life because we're more concerned about Peter or more concerned about Martha than we are the glory of God? But this unpleasantness and this unthinkableness and this unsettling leads to an unfailing assurance. Look at verse number 40. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? God's power is greater than our perceptions. God's omnipotence is greater than our obstinance. 
Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and by thy stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. God has spoken once, he twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. With God nothing shall be impossible. And we finally see in the last chapter a simple decision. Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. A simple decision. Somebody obeyed. Somebody responded. Someone said yes. Jesus comes to this grave. He says, take ye away the stone. Well, he, he's not talking to me. I, I don't know anything about moving stones. I never took a class in that. I make a mess of it. Well, I, I think we better get a permit. You can't just be moving stuff. I mean, there's little, little animals that are about to go extinct under that stone. We've got to get a permit. The government's really careful about this stuff. Well, I think we should form a committee. Aren't you glad somebody obeyed? I bet Lazarus was happy. It's a simple decision to obey. An obstacle is moved. Then they moved the stone. What stone keeps you or me from a miracle tonight? Is it the stone of doubt? Is it the stone of fear? Is it the stone of your own pride? Is it the stone of a friend? Is it the stone of family? What is it that keeps us from God's miracles tonight? Take ye away the stone. And when there's an obstacle removed, we see an omnipotent miracle. In verse 41, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. When we move the stones, that's what we can do. And when we do what we can do, then God does what we cannot do. He raises the dead, the resurrection. I started going to church nine months before I was born. And though we were raised on a farm, we never missed church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, missionary conference, youth activities. If there was something going on at the church, Dad would rearrange all the priorities on that farm so that we could be at the house of God. Never missed a service. I missed one Sunday morning with chicken pox when I was in fifth grade. It's the only one I can recall ever missing. We went to church. My dad was chairman of the deacons, served as a deacon for 36 years. My mother was a Sunday school teacher. My sister was the church pianist. When I was 15 years old, I was president of the youth group at the Calvary Baptist Church in Watertown, Wisconsin. But I was lost. Oh, I acted like a Christian. I knew how a Christian was supposed to behave. I knew the things I was supposed to do and the things I wasn't supposed to do. I had read the script. I memorized the lines. I knew how to act. But inside, I was lost. And at 15 years of age, I went to camp. Summer camp, Bible camp. The first night, the preacher, Dr. Eric Folsom, from St. Petersburg, Florida, stood up and preached a message on hell. And I sat right over here in the auditorium that night and knew that as a Baptist, I was going to hell. As president of the youth group, I was going to hell. 
as a deacon's kid. I was going to the place he was talking about. But when Dr. Folsom extended the invitation that night, I said, I can't. I can't go up there. I can't do that. I can't admit now that I'm not a Christian. What will people think? What will people say? What will my pastor think? What will my friends think? I hung on. I thought if I could get out of that service, I'd never have to think about it again. I guess I hadn't studied very well the uh, omnipresence of God. Boy, it seemed like God followed me back to my cabin. He followed me the next day. Everywhere I went, the Holy Spirit was saying, you need to be saved. And I kept putting it off and putting it off. And Tuesday night, I went to the service and I decided to sit over here. I thought maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking isn't as strong on this side as it is on this side. I sat over here. And I don't remember what Dr. Folsom preached that night. I couldn't tell you even a verse that he quoted. I, I don't remember anything. All I remember is the Holy Spirit preaching to me, saying, you're lost. You need to be saved. And I thought, but I can't. I, I don't want to move that stone. I, I, I don't want to take that risk. I, I don't want to lose friends. I don't want to lose face. I, Lord, I can't. And I hung on. We normally had an activity after the services at night at camp, but that night it was raining and my pastor got up. He was the one who was running the camp and he said, tonight we, we've got some rain. And he said, so we have, a, we have a film we want to show you. That's a movie. <laughs> they used film projectors. I don't remember anything about the movie other than the title. The movie was entitled, There's a New Song in My Heart. I, I don't remember anything about it. I suppose it had something to do with music. All I could remember is sitting in that darkened room thinking I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. God will save me, but I'm going to hell because I won't move a stone of pride. And I sat there and I thought, Lord, if this movie had just ended, I'll, I'll, I'll get saved. If you'll just let my pastor get up there and ask us to come forward, I'll go. Well, the movie ended. And my pastor got up and he said, now, young people, we've already had an invitation tonight, so just go back to your cabin. We'll see you in the morning. I thought, how do you like that? <laughs> now I'm ready to be saved and they won't let me. And I watched those young people go out that back door and I thought to myself, if I go out with them, I'll go straight to hell one day. And I turned to a man standing behind me. His name was Don Foffey. I didn't know him from Adam. Just an adult to me, but he turned out to be a pastor. I said, sir, could you help me? I'm sure he saw conviction all over my face. I'm sure he saw it on the back of my head all night. <laughs> he said, I'd be glad to help you. Down the aisle we came into a little room. And that night, August the 1st, 1967, at 1030 at night, I bowed my head and I got a resurrection. I was dead. And God gave me life. And God wants to give you that life tonight. Do you believe in a resurrection? Believest thou this? Christian, what are you up against? What have you declared to be dead? What have you declared to be impossible? What have you said, God, it's too late. This isn't going to happen. What are you fearing? What are you fretting? Do you believe in a resurrection? Nothing is hopeless. Nothing is impossible. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? May we, as God's people, arise to faith tonight. I believe. 
I believe in the resurrection.